Coming up on Legit Streetcars, my car world comes crashing down. Way worse than before. I am selling the Tesla. This is missing an entire connector. This fuel line decided to rupture. Yeah, the wiper just never stops. I'm just gonna go ahead and say this is officially for sale. Now there are some positives, like I asked the former CEO of Bright for $1 million, and we just call it a solid $1 million for the space van. All right, there it is, guys. And I did get it sold. I also finally received the engine for my SVT Lightning. I cannot wait to show you that. So in this video, we're gonna wrench on some cars, find out how bad everything really is. Hopefully, I can fix something, and then I'll update you on everything else good and bad. Oh, and shout out to my wife who got me this awesome new plaid jacket to match my guy Sung Kang from Fast and the Furious when he was at Legit Street Quarters. Um, Sung, can I get that intake manifold gasket from you? So you guys know that I've been battling an issue with the CL65 where it goes into limp mode after about three seconds of being at wide open throttle. Well, after multiple evening sessions with some very talented tuners, I think we got somewhere. And then I was just simply driving it home, happy as could be, and this happened. Well, this is nice. ABC light just came on in the CL65. Great. Oh no, the red light is on now. That means this thing could be leaking fluid and lowering, and it kind of does actually feel lower. Great. Great. That happened about 20 miles away from my house. I did make it home, but my driveway is telling me the leak is somewhere in the front because I, I pulled in head first. And you can see the car's suspension is lowered. It doesn't work anymore either. I can't raise it up. I've been too scared to check the level here of the hydraulic fluid. Because <sighs> if this is low, you could do damage to the pump and other things. Great. All right. I'll soon be laden. Well, that's awesome. So before we can get this on the rack to figure out where the leak is coming from, we need to fix the leak on the CL. Uh, I put this away like, I don't know, a month, month and a half ago after we hit the dyno and everything went well. Are you kidding me? And I did smell a little bit of E85 and I saw a leak on the ground, just a little one and I just got too busy with everything else. So don't worry, it never leaked on the Grand National. This was like a month and a half ago and it hasn't leaked since. But anyway, let's figure that out and hopefully fix it. At least we got my good old trusty 3.8 liter GM product. Uh. There, there, okay. Come on, baby. Hey, started. This car has been reliable. Here is the glorious VRP Whipple Supercharger Kit. This thing put down 800 wheel horsepower on a base tune at like 10 PSI. It's crazy, I highly recommend this. But right now, I think we have a little bit of a fuel leak and it was coming from this side on the bottom. I'm just gonna give it a quick prime of the fuel pump. Don't wanna go too crazy. Should be good. Oh wow, that is way worse than before. Okay, man, when I pulled it in last and shut it off, seriously, like a month, month and a half ago, it just smelled a little. Now <laughs> it's just puking out. Well, look at the bright side. It should be a pretty obvious diagnosis, right? I believe the leak is coming from this side. So we're gonna pop off this intake and take a better look at the back of the fuel rail. It's a very tight squeeze in here. All right, let's just move this over to the side. Oh yeah, okay. That's leaky. We have fuel all over the valve cover and it looks to be coming from these fittings somewhere. Um, oh, there we go, well that's, that's loose. All right, that'll do it. So this is just a T30 on here so we can tighten it up. Just barely loose. There we go. All right, I'm gonna turn the ignition on. We'll see if anything leaks. Oh my gosh, okay. Woo! <laughs> well, the fitting's really tight. Clearly it's still leaking though. That, wow. All right, let's check out the O-ring situation. Is that it right there? Well, it looks good so far. Gotta be the issue though, right? Okay. Okay, yeah, we're gonna lose some fuel, whatever. What in the world? There's a total of three O-rings on this banjo bolt and they all look to be fine. Looks can be deceiving with O-rings, so I'm gonna go ahead and swap these out. And I'll be gentle just in case we need to go back together with them, but 
Yeah, I don't know. These just look like really thin, kind of flimsy. Look at that. I'm gonna replace those with these slightly thicker green O-rings. These are, of course, fuel resistant as well. I gotta say, these look much better. They protrude out much more. This should fix it. Oh, wow, yeah. This is already a much tighter fit. Oh, this is great. The old ones were just kind of flapping around in there. Now I can get the final O-ring on. The final O-ring. There we go. All right, let's try this again, Keon. Anything, anything, anything? Oh, are we good? I hear lots of noises. Fuel has definitely gotten here. Oh yeah. No, I think we're good guys. I think we're good. Oh yeah. We got our 60-ish PSI of fuel pressure. Everything is flowing back and this is a full return system. So we have fuel everywhere. All right, the green O-rings fixed it. So I'm gonna do the other side and Craig from Modern Masters built this fuel system. He did a phenomenal job, but he came in just for a few days from West Virginia and we were running low on parts. So there's a specific brand fitting that he likes to use. We had to source these locally. I don't even know what brand they are, but I think they're just really cheap ones. So. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna replace the O-rings at the very least. I might just get the fittings that he typically uses. So definitely not his fault at all. This happens when you use cheap parts. It's pretty cold out. It's been about six weeks. Super cold start. Woo. Oh, that battery was low. Listen to this thing. It idled down with those VRP cams, long two batters. Oh, I love it. Instant, the throttle, insane. Before we get the CL on the rack to hopefully find out that it has just like a loose fitting or a super easy hose to replace, I don't, I don't know why I'm jinxing myself, back on air. Some of the lines on that thing require you to literally drop the transmission and sometimes the engine, it's insane. But let's, oh, please don't be that. But anyway, before we get to that, let me update you on a couple vehicles that are functioning really well. And one of those vehicles would be my 2015 Cadillac Escalade. This is supercharged. It now has over 100,000 miles. And in the last episode, I lowered the suspension, made a cold air intake for it, and it's a champ. And my wife is actually back to driving the Escalade. I am gonna be selling the Tesla Model X Plaid. I'll get to that a little bit later, but it just didn't work out. So she's back in the Escalade and honestly happier than ever. Another fully functioning vehicle is my 1986 Buick Grand National. Sure, when it's 30 degrees out and you haven't started it in a couple of weeks, it has a little bit of trouble, but this thing seriously runs really, really nice. The engine is in excellent condition, the transmission, the rear end, everything just works and I, I love it. And it's all re-detailed up because I let Sung Kang from the Fast and the Furious borrow the Grand National for an entire week of filming for his brand new TV show that comes out this year. So you guys will see him cruising around Chicago like everywhere in my GN. So after that whole week of filming, it was kind of dirty. So the guys at Chicago Auto Pros detailed it up and she's back. Back in black and beautiful. Look at this thing. It's so cool. It needs a Typhoon sitting next to it and a Cyclone and an 89 Turbo Trans Am. That is, what's not, it's not a trifecta. It's a, I don't know, I can't think right now. It's a four trifecta. I feel kind of dumb right now. Okay, I guess it's a quad fecta. I guess I've never really thought of this. I Googled what's the four version of trifecta. And it's quad fecta. Don't say I never taught you nothing. Don't say I never taught you nothing. That's really dumb too. Hang on, before we diagnose the CL, just a quick reminder that there are only a few days left of the 15% off everything sale at LegitStreetCars.com. And if you wanna save even more, we have the ultimate car care bundle that includes a foam cannon, a wash mitt, a set of detail brushes, a gigantic dry towel, not one or two or three, but four ultra plush microfibers, a clay mitt, and a Legit Street Cars key tag. My foam cannon makes the best foam in the world because it uses a super high quality machined brass valve body and my all time favorite has to be the gigantic drying towel. Words can't describe how amazing this thing is. Actually they can. Here are some reviews from people who've bought the drying towel. I'm telling you it will change your life. If you wash your own car it's a must have as you can dry your car in just a couple of minutes. One swipe and it's dry and it doesn't leave any streaks. Anyway the sale ends soon. Link down below below. Thank you so much for your support. Now back to the video. All right, here we go. It runs well, guys, but it is slammed. 
and the brakes like to make noise in the morning. Now what really stinks is we have to lift this somehow. Okay, never mind. It was actually easy to get the lift arms under because it's not totally slammed to the bump stops, which is a very, very good sign that we didn't lose all of the fluid. Oh man, yeah, we definitely have a leak. It's gotten all the way to the exhaust. There is the wonderful ABC hydraulic fluid. It is very expensive. It's all over the place. Well, there's drips everywhere. It doesn't mean that's where it's leaking from. So it very well could have leaked from somewhere in here. And then I was on the highway, so it just kind of blasted itself back that way. A little bit of a leak there. Let's get this, let's get this off. -da -da -da. -da -da -da. Anyone else have that stuck in their head now? All day long with the final countdown. Final green O-ring that's fuel resistant. It fixes everything. Doesn't let any fuel get past it. Na, 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 na. Okay. It's not totally saturated, so that means the leak is probably right here. Yeah, it's really difficult to see where this leak is coming from because there's hydraulic fluid everywhere. It could be this line, and then it's just leaking down and going back. Um, let's fire this up. So we're gonna have to add some hydraulic fluid, and this is the tool I have to open the hood. There we go. It needs a little bit of upwards pressure, otherwise it just won't open. So this works perfectly. And if I ever sell this car, the turtle wax scratch repair and renew comes with it. I am fresh out of this really inexpensive fluid. So let's go pick some up. I gotta find a cheaper way to get this power steering fluid for the CL, $42 a liter. I do have an account at most auto parts stores. So I saved like $2. You know, it's much cheaper than one of these one of these. Link down below, just saying. So we might be wasting some of this, but there's really no other way to diagnose the problem. We need to put fluid in the system in order for it to come right back out and tell us where the leak is. Drink up, little buddy, drink up, you expensive piece of All right, well, some's on the dipstick. The pump will suck this down, but hopefully it's just enough for us to see where the leak is. Let's start it up. Love that V12 sound. Check engine light is totally normal. And I definitely jinxed myself. Once I hit 137,000 miles, I posted up on Instagram and Facebook. There we go. And I was like, look guys, I made it to 137,000 miles and it's running well. And we did some tuning stuff. By the way, if you guys want updates in between videos, at legit street cars on Instagram and Facebook. But I posted that up. And then while well, you saw the mileage there, uh, like a hundred miles later, this happened. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, oh my gosh. All right, oh, that was like 10 bucks. Oh, we should be able to find the leak though. This is great. And it didn't seem like high up like engine, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, leaking CO. I, I love you. No, no, not yet. Oh, that was more than 10 bucks. Okay, how did I make it home? That's what I'd like to know. Okay, it's coming from right there. And hopefully that's not that high up. Yeah, there's a hose There's a hose in here. I'd like to say it's this one in here, but you never know. All right, I have my wife inside the car because I can't find the leak. It's just wet everywhere. She's gonna fire it up and then shut it off immediately. Uh, wear eye protection. All right, babe, let's do it. Okay. Where is it coming from? Okay, so it's like, it's gotta be right in there. All right, go again. All right, all right, all right. okay. Yeah, all right guys, very difficult to see, but that pipe right there, that little horseshoe one, it connects to this hose here, and this actually just dead ends, and then it goes all the way to the pump somewhere, you know, somewhere in there. I'm almost positive I have to drop the entire subframe to get to that. You guys wanna see something crazy? I pulled out the hose, and look at, look what we have going on here. So this is the one that I suspected was leaking, and I've definitely confirmed that. This is the inside of the hose, I guess? Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's that's that. Hold on, how far does this go in? Oh, there it is. Wow, this is crazy. Yeah, I mean, it completely just busted. You know, I'm gonna call the dealership because I thought I replaced that one. If so, I mean, granted it was like three years ago at this point, maybe it's still under warranty, but I'm pretty sure I replaced that one. I don't know. But that is crazy. I've never really thought about the inside of these really high pressure ABC hydraulic hoses, but I never thought I'd see a clear tube like that. And then it ends. So, I don't know. All right, well, 
that's that. I definitely have to replace that one. And I thought at first that I might have to drop the subframe, but it, it might not be that bad. I mean, it's, it's still, it's still going to be bad. But anyway, next video, you guys will see me kind of trying to diagnose what's wrong with the engine and then this, and then we'll get right back into the engine and hopefully hit the dyno. If nothing else really bad happens, there's always like a, I don't know, 67% chance of, of that. 60% of the time it works every time. That's a fun way to blow through about 50 or 60 bucks. But honestly, the fluid and that hose, that repair, it's pretty cheap for the CL65. So we have fixed the C63 fuel leak. We've diagnosed the CL. The Escalade's good. The Grand National is good. Uh, and that pretty much covers everything that we're going to do here. There's some more cars at the shop, obviously. And then we're going to Fluid Motor Union and I'm working on the Porsche. But before we head out, I'm just going to splice in some footage of the farewell to the space van, a Zoom call with one of the CEOs and a phone call with the main CEO that ended up buying the van. I asked for a million bucks. But anyway, I'm going to splice in that footage because it happened over the last month or so. And then we're hopping in the McLaren to drive back to legit street quarters. Hello, John. Waters. Hey, John, it's Alex. Hey, Alex, how's it going, man? Good, good. How are you? Hey, doing great. Awesome, awesome. So I kind of wanted to get down to the nitty gritty and see how serious you are about this thing. Yeah, I'd love to have it back. I got some, uh, a lot of strong emotions attached to that vehicle and, and uh, we're aligned on trying to do the right thing with it. Right. Yeah, John and I have talked about something charitable as far as, you know, if he were to buy it, you know, what we could do with the funds and stuff. So maybe help some kids out there. So what I was thinking for the space van, because it cost over $2 million to build back in like 2010. And then with the inflation that we've had, it's probably more like $3 million. So I was thinking about giving you a massive discount and we just call it a solid $1 million. $1 million for the space van, so. <laughs> Hold it, Alex, I already, I already spent two million on it. So I, do I not gotta spend another million on it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a pretty good deal overall. Uh, One million bucks, it's a beautiful van. The tires are in really good condition. <laughs> the four cylinder engine runs perfectly and it does lot drive, you know, it does lot drive. <laughs> I heard you broke an axle. Yeah, I broke an axle. Yeah, well, that should be a pretty big discount. I'm not buying a $2 million stamper. <laughs> you guys designed it. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, so a million bucks is out. I think I have about 3000 into the van. So what if we did 10000 bucks for the van, I get 3000 and the other 7000 we can donate to a school. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great idea, Alex. We've got a college here, actually. I've even spoken to uh, Franklin College, and they're okay. doing super entrepreneurial activity, which the van represents, in addition to energy and transportation advancements for the future. Cool. So you're down with that? Like, we'll just do 10000 yeah. but 3000 of each. The rest, you know, we donate to the school, and then I know you're going to be doing some classes there and, and stuff like that, maybe? Yeah, I think that's that's right aligned with our vision and mission and purpose. Yeah, I think if that school could use it, I, I had a couple of mine here in Chicago, but if you want to grab the van and then maybe even bring it to these schools also, I think that would just, that would be phenomenal. I'll tell you what, I'll do it if you go with me. <laughs> so you, you got to fix the axle though. Yeah, we'll, we'll take care of it. The cool. team will be very excited. It's uh, getting back to a good home and awesome. where it started from. And we definitely appreciate all of your work and, uh, and honoring of the of the folks who put that amazing vehicle together actually of course. so do appreciate your program yeah i'm glad i mean i, I put probably 20 30 miles on it which i think was a lot for that vehicle so <laughs> i recommend you bring a trailer when you come out here okay. and yeah i'll have it all i'll have it outside ready to go all right i'll see you soon all right thanks john appreciate it you bet all right thank thanks, you john. all right bye all right overall i think that went pretty well i didn't really think i was gonna get a million dollars quite honestly i don't think this thing is worth much of anything to anyone but the former CEO. And I know this because I emailed like five museums that take on weird cars like this, concept cars and like really early EV stuff. None of them wanted this. I think they saw some of the videos and they were like, no, we'll pass. You know, it's 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 a liability. No one knows how to work on it and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things, you know, when you guys see a listing for a car and people are like, it's only worth what people will pay for it, which is supposed to be obvious. This is the perfect example of this. There's only one person in this world that would pay really anything for this and ten thousand dollars you know in total i think is pretty darn good but right, i just charged up the battery so hopefully john will be here with a trailer and we'll get this guy out of here and i'll have an extra parking spot and here's the final update on the space van it is loaded up on the trailer and we have john the original ceo from bright here to pick it up there you are sir one space concept van close to my heart 
Right. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Of course, of course. And here are the clay molds. John, you got the uh, the big one and the little one is right around the corner there. Yeah. So everything's in there. What that reminds me of, Alex, is the day we had a, a clay packing party. And before we did that, we brought our families in and our children and families all signed our autographs on the wooden uh, mock-up behind the clay. No. And we, then we packed the clay and then the artist take their tools like they've been doing for a hundred years and start scraping the form and the shape of the bright idea. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm so glad that they came with the van then and you guys can have them back. That's phenomenal. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of emotion piled into the clay, into right. this vehicle. So awesome. thanks again for taking care of it for us. Of course. All right, 3,000 so bucks. 2,000 bundle and a 1,000 bundle. I trust you. Yeah. And then $7,000 is going to Franklin College, right? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Happy way. We'll be able to bring the van over there probably at one point. Yeah, if we get it running. Yeah. All you need is the all you need is the axle in there. The, the you know I did all the battery modules, and they will charge up with just a normal J1772 connector yeah. that you can buy off Amazon or whatever for a Thank couple you. hundred bucks. Yeah. Um. So one yeah once you get the custom axle made, you know it'll it'll. It'll drive. I mean, I'm not saying you should go on any trips with it, as you guys saw in the video, but it'll go 20, 30 miles an hour for a little while. Well, I'll just tell you and your audience, this isn't the last you've heard of it. Just, okay. Seriously, I'll be contacting you in the future when cool. this thing is growing in a new life. Awesome. The story's not over. All right. There it is, guys. The space van update for you. Michael Brylowski. I said that right? Yeah, right? perfect. Good. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> and he is the co-founder of Bright. So this is a different co-founder of the company. And we had connected online. I found him on LinkedIn. And uh, I just had, you know, questions back when I was trying to figure everything out with the van. Anyone from Bright <laughs> to me, I wanted to reach out to. And uh, Michael was gracious enough to hop on this Zoom with us and uh, and chat. So have you seen the video series? Or parts yeah, I so first of all, I had several people send me the uh, the link, so I got to skim through them, and I just want to thank you for uh, rescuing the vehicle and bringing it back to life. Um, it really made a lot of people very happy. I had I had fun. It was frustrating, yeah. but at the end of the day, it, you know, it's the adventure that I that I go for. So I believe you took it farther than the original design intention of this vehicle. Really, it was really a show car. I mean, it was design. It wasn't. A production vehicle, as you know, it wasn't even a pre-production vehicle. It was created to give investors, customers, the government who was we were working in a loan at the time an idea of what this vehicle would look like to touch and feel it. But right. it was not, as you said, it wasn't engineered to be manufactured. That was a later version that we were working on. Do you remember this thing like actually driving? Because that was the one thing I couldn't really get a clear answer on from the internet was, did people actually drive this? Because there's videos of, there's just like a 10 second video of it driving, but we know that that can be fake, you know? Yeah. So. No, I mean, it drove, as you know, I mean, again, I and I was more on the business side and the customer right. side than the engineering side. I am an engineer, but not nearly the talented engineers that Bright had, hundreds, I'm sorry, dozens of great engineers. The vehicle did drive. So, you know, like in the, in the audience, industry they call show cars sometimes pushers mm -hmm. they're designed to be pushed on stage sometimes they have like a golf cart motor this had a working drive system that was a proof of concept of what they call a through the road hybrid that we were architecting so you know that electric rear axle and you had a front transverse mounted you know four cylinder and they were to work together so the, in that sense those things work and the vehicle was designed to go but not very fast. I mean, again, it, as you said, didn't have wipers, didn't have ventilation, didn't have defrosters. So it was really a proof of concept. And again, yeah. I think you took it way farther than the original intent back in 2008. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have. I got up to 40 in this thing yeah. and it went maybe, I don't know, I think I drove it a total of like 30 miles and then the axle snapped. The rear <laughs> bracket for the motor would just crack every single time, essentially. So like I could tell it wasn't really designed to go very far. Like lot lot driving was probably the extent of what it was supposed to yeah, do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, yeah, that video you're talking about, I think was on a, either a test track or yeah. uh, something like that. But yeah, I think 40 miles an hour is the equivalent of taking like an F1 car to like 300. I mean, I think you really, <laughs> I think you really push the envelope on that. So, well, so again, I'm glad you're still I'm here. glad to be alive. Yeah. The space man. Also, it was also a 15 year old vehicle. I mean, this thing right. was 2007, 2008. Right. So I even think it made it your level of difficulty was even harder. Yeah. Uh, given that it was 15 years old. And right. the fact that it ran to me is like just it's a miracle. I'm incredibly impressed with what you did. 
it took it took it took some work, but uh, hopefully John will you know carry the torch here and and keep going with it. Uh, I, I honestly I don't know how far you can really go with it outside of reinventing everything though. That's the thing. There's no schematics in 2024. Everything is so outdated on that. So like. You know, a lot of my viewers were like, well, you, you know, you should completely, you know, Tesla swap it or LS swap it. I'm like, well, hang on, guys. You got to understand this isn't even like a real car. Like the floors are made of wood. Like it's to be shown, right. you, you right. know, like I'd be building a car from scratch if I was to just swap something in. Um, for sure. So for sure. My I mean, it was, it, always... it was literally, you know, designed and built before the iPhone came out. I mean, it's, it's that so crazy. Right? There was a lot of work on making that into a production vehicle that, that went beyond that car. I mean, that was from 2008, right? Uh, was around until 2012. So there was several years of engineering work that came after that prototype. Yeah, for sure. Well, it was definitely an experience. I know you got to run, but thank you yeah. so much for hopping on the Zoom with me. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll stay in contact. Hopefully we'll hear. Yeah, from and, and again, I just want again, I, I had so many people forward me the video. That company, I mean, again, it's a relic of history. Things move really fast in today's world. And for you to bring this back just meant a lot to a lot of people. And so we really appreciate what you did. It really... It, it warmed our hearts. So thank you so much for what you did. Well, thank you, Mike. That's honestly, that's like best case scenario whenever I do one of these projects is that it makes other people happy, but especially the people yeah. that may have been involved in that vehicle before, you know, because I rescue a lot of abandoned stuff and then the previous owners see the videos and they contact me and it's, yeah, I know this was a team effort. John said there were dozens of people working on it. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad I could get it to drive and I'm glad I'm, yeah. I'm also still alive. I'm happy for that. Well, <laughs> well, thank you for rescuing a bit of EV history and it's so much appreciated. So awesome. and thanks. Thanks again. Yes. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate everything. We'll talk soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, of course, the McLaren's broken too. ESC fault, vehicle limp home. Go to McLaren. It yells at you. What else? Engine system fault. Again, call McLaren. Hey, that's about it, I think. I'm going to try and fix the McLaren here in a few moments, but let me show you guys what's going on outside in the lot, including the Lightning engine. Back out in the parking lot, and I only have three vehicles out here to update you on, and surprisingly, they're not all that broken. So apparently, I keep all the good stuff outside. So you already know that the space van is gone. This is where it had been parked for the last month or so. So I have an open parking spot, which is really nice, and it's right next to this. So a lot of you guys ask about this Toyota, and it is not mine, it's my neighbor's, and so is the Lexus. He basically just lets them sit there. He will not sell them. I've already asked, so yeah, these are not mine. Although they kind of do look like cars I would buy, especially this one's just all abandoned looking. It's got like 40,000 miles on it too, he said. But anyway, he won't sell it. There's nothing I can do about it. But here is the ML55 AMG. And this is actually not broken, although it's sitting on my beautiful all aluminum mission trailer. It was broken, I took it off roading, and the nut that used to be right here for this upper control arm disappeared. So I had replaced these upper control arms, all new hardware, torqued in there, everything, like a couple of years ago. And then when I was off roading, it literally poofed and disappeared. The threads were fine, everything was fine here, but because the upper control arm popped out, it put everything at a weird angle and destroyed the axle boot. So I need to get a new axle boot on the ML and then I think I'm going to either install some cotter pins or two nuts or something on these just to make sure that never happens again. No plans to get rid of the ML55. It literally just sits there on the trailer and then whenever we want to go off-roading we just go off-roading with it. It's very cheap. It's fun to abuse off-road because you don't care if you scratch it up. In fact getting new scratches and new dents is a ton of fun with this thing and I'm able to just beat the ever-living crap out of it and, and not care. Next is my 2012 Chevy Caprice PPV. I should just call this good old trusty. I'm so bad with nicknames, but there's really nothing wrong with the Caprice. I could daily drive this. It is extremely loud though. I mean, not that the McLaren isn't, um, but when the CL broke, I was on my way home from the shop and this was at the shop. So I've just been taking the McLaren and driving that. But anyway, nothing really wrong with the Caprice. You guys know I dropped the engine on this a few years ago, deleted all of the active fuel management, installed a gigantic cam, long tube headers, a billet torque converter, 
I also did a nitrous system. It has all new tires. Everything is good to go. I drove this down to a really big Holden event at my buddy Travis Bell's house in Indiana. It was amazing. I got to meet a lot of the Holden community here in the United States and they were so welcoming. It was so much fun and I can't wait to bring it back next year. So no real plans of selling this. It's it's just a good car. And sitting next to that 2012 Chevy is another 2012 Chevy, my LSC Express van. This is my supercharged 15 passenger van. Uh, I really love this thing. The lightning engine is inside of it, which we are going to look at in a moment. We got to cut the bag open and see if the machine shop actually did anything. This van is in good shape, except out of nowhere, one day, a couple of months ago, the belt flew off and I was having a lot of issues with that. Basically it flew off for no reason, just driving around and all of a sudden it just came off the pulleys and I was able to duplicate that every time you went wide open throttle at a higher RPM, it would fly off and I pinpointed it to flying off the alternator, but there was nothing wrong with the alternator. I did find a cracked pulley for the belt tensioner, so I replaced that. It did not fix it. Then I replaced the harmonic balancer because it has a little rubber sleeve in there and it's got 205,000 miles on it. So I thought that was shifting. Uh, that also didn't fix it. But you wanna know what fixed it? Absolutely nothing. And that is the mystery of the van. So I could get this to happen at will. I could sit here at idle, rev it up and write it a specific RPM, the belt would fly off. And then one day it just stopped doing that for no reason. And it hasn't flown off since. It's been like, I don't know, three months, probably a thousand miles or something like that. I've towed with it as well. No issues whatsoever. But that's why I haven't had a video out on this. I started filming one so much so that it even destroyed another pulley, but there was never a conclusion. There was, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't learn anything. Like if I came out with that video, I'd be like, guys, I don't, I don't know what fixed it. So I, I don't know what to tell you. Like I had no advice to give other than I don't trust the van right now because I need to get the belt to fly back off so I can get back to diagnosing it, but it won't come off no matter what I do now. So I, I don't know what to say. Like, do I take this on a thousand mile road trip to pick up some abandoned car and then all of a sudden the belt flies off? Like I need to fix it, but I don't know what's wrong because I can't duplicate it. Anyway, it's, it's driving me mad. So I just, I use the van still like locally and stuff like that. Just waiting, waiting for that belt to fly off. I even went to the auto parts store and bought a super cheap ratchet and socket so that I could change out the belt on the road. And I have an extra belt with me in the van at all times. So I don't know, who knows? Hopefully one day it'll, it'll fly off. And look at this belt at idle. It's absolutely perfect. It's totally straight. There are no issues, no chirps, nothing. You can see here that it flies off right at the alternator every time. This thing is mounted completely factory. Nothing was changed because of the Pro Charger for the mounting of the alternator. The bearing is fine. Everything on the alternator is perfect. And I completely eliminated the Pro Charger system. So I ran the stock belt, no Pro Charger whatsoever. It still does the exact same thing. So the issue has nothing to do with the Pro Charger system that's been on the van now for 5,000 miles and never had any issues. And we beat on this van a lot after the build and it was perfect. So I'm not sure what else is going on here. If you guys have any ideas of what could throw the belt off at high RPMs from the alternator, let me know. At this point, I might just try an alternator. Maybe there's some weird fluke thing going on with it. I don't know, but hopefully this belt flies off soon because I want to trust my van again. For now, let's take a look at this. I got everything back for the Lightning. So my engine for the Lightning basically was held hostage for the last 12 months at least, maybe more. Long story short, machine shops can be very, very difficult to deal with. And so I had brought this to a machine shop that said they could do it in like three weeks. Again, long story short, six months later, they hadn't touched it. And I checked in probably every three weeks. I wasn't annoying. I would just call, hey, what's the update? What do you, I mean, how else do you put it, right? I wasn't being mean or anything. You might see everything back by Thursday-ish. How did the heads look? Actually, they're on a head bench right now. Oh, okay. So it's done through uh, 
sitting here having some coffee. I'm gonna start working on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna get to it. We're gonna get to it. Six months later, and I'm like, guys, seriously, what's going on? I just showed up. They hadn't touched it. I'm like, we're we're just gonna take this back now. So I got it out of there. Unfortunately, they had lost a ton of parts. So these little dowels inside of the engine that you can only get from Ford, and then I thought they were discontinued because that's what the dealer told me. Anyway, they lost those. They lost my rings, my brand new rings, and then they had mixed and matched all the cam bolts. So they had like taken stuff apart and it was a disaster. So I brought it to another machine shop that said they could do it in three weeks, same thing. And then about six months later, they finally finished it. Supposedly, let's cut this open. All right, so, ooh, that looks good. All right, well, at least it's clean. And I just kind of asked for the works here. So this thing has been line honed with the ARP mains. So this is gonna be a very stout engine once I'm done building it. But you can see all of the fresh machine work. We can also see how nice and shiny the cylinders are. Everything seems to be okay. And by okay, I mean something was done. I don't know if it's okay until I start building it. So we have all new freeze plugs as well. There are a ton of freeze plugs on this engine. And then they smoothed out the cylinder mating surface for me. So that's nice. And then uh, we have the cylinder heads right in there and then all of my parts. So I have forged rods and pistons, different rings set up for boost. And we have the factory crank that they polished out as well. Here are the rings. So there is your update on the SVT Lightning. I am dying to get this thing back on the road. I don't have an exact ETA on when I'm getting to the engine because now I'm like smack dab in the middle of, of so many other projects that are rolling and have like a better chance of, of being done a lot quicker. So I just, I need to get those kind of out of the way first, but yes, I will get back to the Lightning. Before we get to the other cars, let's just try fixing the McLaren really quick. Goodbye. I don't know why, but everything under here just seems to pick up all the dust and dirt. It's, it's kind of strange. Maybe it's coming in from the road. I don't know. So I suspect that I actually caused this issue and to verify we need to remove the steering wheel. And there are a couple clips in here that you can push in with a screwdriver to release the airbag. All right, so I just pushed on the clip on this side, and here we go. Here's our little McLaren airbag. I got the airbag out of the way, so now we can remove the one bolt that holds the steering wheel on. Now, let's see, did I mess this up? I hope so, because if I did, it's free to fix. Yep, this is my fault. See how all the splines are exactly the same? They look like that top and bottom. But on the inside of the steering wheel, you can see that bottom spline is different, and there's one on the very top as well. So I thought there was only one way for the steering wheel to go on, when in fact you could spline it on this way, or this way, or any which way you want. So last week, I replaced the turn signal switch. It just stopped working, so I put a used one in here, and I think I was off by a tooth on the steering wheel. And as soon as you start rolling, the car realizes that the steering angle is not correct and it starts to freak out. So I think we can fix that. I think the wheels are as straight as they get. And I just re-splined the steering wheel also straight. I think I just barely had it off like that or something when I put it back on. I actually replaced the switch with my son anytime I get a chance to show him just anything on a car, like how to fix the turn signal on a McLaren. I take that opportunity. So dad messed up, kid. This is this is what you should do. Steering wheel bolt is back in. We have our airbag plugged in. And now this just does one of these. Okay, no lights on. Yeah, okay. Never mind. Transmission fault. What? What? Oh, this thing is crazy. Why? I didn't do anything. Okay, hang on, guys. Hang on. Sometimes these things are just. I've never seen that. What in the world? Uh, I think I figured it out. This plug kind of popped out. Okay, there we go. All right, the plug is fully secured. I made a little white dot there too, so I know where the steering wheel goes back on. Okay, let's do this. All right, come on, McLaren. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Okay, I'm okay with that. Service exceeded, whatever. Is that it? Let's just, let's just go for a ride, okay? I'll, I'll take whatever that last one was. Uh, according to the forums that pops up sometimes. Oh my gosh, the Lexus moves. It's so crazy. No joke, haven't seen that thing move in, in like six months. All right, so far, so, ah, oh, Jesus, no. Just buy Lexuses, people. 
That 1990 Lexus up there, way more reliable than a much newer McLaren. So I have a steering angle sensor failure plausibility check, but this all started when I took off the steering wheel to replace the turn signal switch. I didn't have this issue before, so I wonder if there's a relearn procedure I need to do. All right, guys, I think I figured it out. Check it out, steering angle, it's at zero right now. And look at the wheel. So when I move it back to what we think looks straight, we're at 17.9. So I think I know why this is. It may have been my fault. Okay, so my fault again. I think I need to have this computer hooked up when I set the steering on this. So I'll pop the airbag out and then reconnect the battery. We'll set an airbag light, whatever. I'll clear it. Um, yeah, let's do this. All right, steering wheel is straight. We're at 19 degrees. Let's make this zero. There we go. All right, well, I put the steering wheel back on. It's zeroed out and everything. Same thing happens. I spoke to Cannonball Garage and they said it has to be recalibrated with the special McLaren diagnostic tool, which I do not have. So next time I'm at Cannonball, I'll get that done. And, and then maybe we won't have any lights on the cluster of the McLaren for like a few hours, there's always something. Well, it's the next day. I spent about, I don't know, four hours on the McLaren, unfortunately, because it has a brand new electrical problem. Check this out. Just wanna show you that without the steering wheel or anything connected at all, you turn power on and the wiper blade is stuck on. Yeah, the wiper just never stops. It's stuck on a low speed. I've tried everything because I had a whole nother, I'm gonna turn this off. Uh, it's gonna yell at me. Hang on. I have a whole nother clock spring with all the switches and everything. I tried swapping everything over, nothing fixed it, and I disconnected it all, and it still wipes, which indicates a short circuit somewhere. And, and then I found this. So do you guys see how this one pin is shorter than the rest? Well, that's one of the pins that you plug in when you take the steering wheel on and off, and the pin broke off the solder and then shorted against another pin. I've literally never seen this happen in my life. Everything fit in perfectly. Yeah. So now I have 68 pages of McLaren wiring diagrams to go through to try and figure out where the short may be. And if it's in the body control module, that part alone is $5,000. So this all started because I just swapped out the stock for the turn signal. I fixed that. And then I thought I had the steering wheel, you know, on wrong and that just needs to be calibrated. And now, yeah the wiper stuck on. So that's fun, did not need that. So from the McLaren, I'll show you the other gigantic wiring nightmare that I've run into some issues on the Cobra. So if you guys have been watching the Cobra videos, you know that I had to repair the ECU harness for this car and I put it back in and we got it to run and I thought everything was good. So then I'm working on the first drive video. I wanna drive this car and finish everything. So there's a lot going on in that video, but I, I realized that this is missing an entire connector. I had bought another ECU harness out of an 03 GT, which ended up being different for many other reasons, but it has that connector. It's for the transmission. And I was told that even the manual ECU harnesses had that connector, which they do, but this harness has been heavily modified. You guys saw I had to do a bunch of repairs. I ended up going to the wiring diagram, tracing back a bunch of colors to the main ECU plug they changed a bunch. It's like impossible. I'd have to unravel the whole thing and literally build a custom harness to fix this. It's totally not worth it. Uh, so I did find a 1999 automatic Mustang engine harness. So that should be identical to what I need and it's coming in the mail. So hopefully that fixes all of my wiring issues. Uh, and we have a lot of other cool things in that video. I'm like halfway done with that. And that's kind of the theme right now. I'm halfway done with a bunch of stuff, including the videos with nothing really to show because I don't like putting out incomplete videos. We gotta drive it in the next one. So I have to figure all this out and then uh, hopefully the Cobra will be back on the road after 20 years. Before we take a look at the rest of the fleet, something that most of my cars have in common is that I have ceramic coated them with the Armor Shield 9 DIY kit. This is a very complete kit with the gloves, the applicator pad, the microfiber, and one of these is enough for your entire car, including the wheels, glass, and trim. And if you have a larger truck or SUV, you can buy two. And for a very limited time, this complete kit that's normally $75 is only 
$50. So you're going to save $25 and you're going to get their Rim Reaper wheel and tire cleaner totally free. And the Rim Reaper is another $15 value. So it's a great deal right before spring. I just wanted to let you guys know. I'll drop the link down below and I'll leave a four minute tutorial I made on how to ceramic coat your car. It's super easy. You can coat your entire car in like two hours. So take advantage of the deal, link it down below. Not much of an update on my 2001 Turbo Trans Am WS6. The last video I made on this was installing a brand new Comp Turbo and this is a completely self-sustained turbo. So there is no oil running to it. There is no coolant running to it. It's kind of like a supercharger in the sense that it's all inside of the turbo. It has a really high temp grease pack that you have to replace the grease in like every, I don't know, three or 5,000 miles, something like that. But the TA is good to go, really. I mean, there's not a whole lot that's wrong with it other than just stuff I wanna do, which is get rid of all the drag suspension, lower it, maybe do some different wheels, retint the windows, and then I might go back to a manual transmission, but it's all like elective. It runs and drives really nice. And I'm never getting rid of that car. I got it when I was 18 years old and I'm like 28 years old now. So it's been like 10 years, 28. I can do it. On the other hand, the Tesla Model X Plaid is a vehicle that I am going to be selling. So I got this for my wife and then I hijacked the Escalade for my daily driver. And I think this was about four months ago now. And I really love the Plaid. It is amazing. My wife thinks it's cool too, but it's just the space in the back that's an issue. So we have kids and these kids are into sports and stuff. He's got documentation. Play ball! And this just isn't cutting it. Normally there's a floor here. I took that out so we'd have even more room. But yeah, it's just, it's not that big. You could totally make this work. You can have a Model X and have kids. This is like an American problem. But the Escalade ESV, the long wheelbase, full-size GM SUVs, have so much room, even when the third row is in use. And then we have a couple of grandparents that we towed around with the kids as well. It was just one of those things where we ran into issues like on so many occasions that I'm like, all right, do we just get rid of this? We tried it out, it didn't work. My goal was to give her a smaller SUV so she could have a garage spot. That garage spot never really materialized either. So if it's just gonna sit outside, might as well at least have a bunch of room. So I am selling the Tesla. I am gonna take a big loss on the Tesla because these things have tanked. So if it's not gone by the time this video is out, which it might be, but if you guys are interested in a really nice spec Model X Plaid, uh, you can email me at legitstreetcars at gmail.com. These things typically retail with 24,000 miles in the low 80s. All I need out of this thing is like, $78,000. So there's ones with accident history selling for like 80. So if you guys are interested, it's a really good deal. You can fly into Chicago and drive it home to wherever you live in the United States. It won't, it won't go over, you know, oceans. Next on the update is my wonderful DeLorean. So I did a very extensive series, I think about 10 videos on restoring this car. And then we drove it to my house on October 31st, Halloween. And of course it was snowing, which is kind of crazy even for Chicago. But that was my goal was to finish this car in time for it to be a Halloween decoration. And then my wife and I dressed up. I was Marty and she was Jennifer. And uh, yeah, I had a great time and then winter hit. So I haven't really done a whole lot of driving the DeLorean because the weather is horrible. But plans for this car, I'm always kind of just looking for a mint condition frame. So the frame in this is not that bad. After coming out with those videos and speaking with a lot of DeLorean people, they're like, dude, we've seen frames that are like five times worse and they get fixed and it's not an issue. They're like, yours isn't bad. Like that's that would be sold as like a good frame. <laughs> um, so it's mostly cosmetic with the rust issues going on. I could have it fixed. So, I, you know, I'm not in a real hurry. Like I could also just drive it. I encapsulated all the rust, so it's not gonna rust anymore. So I can just drive it. And I'm just kind of in the back of my head looking one day for like in mint condition, Arizona, like Southern frame that pops up for sale. And then maybe I'll just swap the whole frame and call it a day or have fluid, just fix it, you know, weld it up, whatever. I'm not really too concerned. I'm just gonna enjoy the DeLorean. It needs a couple little things. It developed an exhaust leak from the exhaust manifolds. And yeah, just a couple little tiny things, but I'm, I'm yeah. 
The DeLorean's good. I'm definitely keeping it forever. I love this car. It's in really, really nice condition after all of the work and it looks super pretty in the shop. This is my 1995 Eclipse GSX. This is another keeper. Once you see the old LSC license plates on there, you know I'm keeping it for a long, long time, if not forever. So in the last video, we replaced the turbo and a few other things. This thing rips now just on a bass tune, but this fuel line decided to rupture. Hello and it leaked fuel everywhere. Of course they don't make it, so I have to figure something out with fittings and all that kind of good stuff. But in the next video, we're installing way bigger fuel injectors. We're finishing off kind of the rest of the fuel system with a boost reference regulator. And then it's most likely gonna get tuned, I think in that one. I think we're ready for a dyno tune. And then at that point, I'm, I'm kind of like done with the, with the work. I already fixed everything mechanically, just sorted it out. And then it's onto cosmetics. I think I'm gonna get a, a whole new paint job, wheels, lowered, bigger brakes, and that's, that's about it for the Eclipse. I just want a really nice, reliable 400 wheel-ish horsepower DSM that doesn't break all the time. Broken fuel line crossed. Behind me is another vehicle that I will be selling. This, this is, I'm just gonna go ahead and say this is officially for sale. And that is my beautiful 1993 Ruby Red 40th anniversary C4 Corvette. It is pro-charged, it has headers, a second fuel pump, a few other modifications, and uh, it's got a really cool 90s body kit. If you guys saw the series on this, I fixed up all sorts of stuff, including the Opti Spark. We fixed a few oil leaks and just generally went around and sorted everything. Something I didn't show in a video was that the transmission went bad, so I replaced the entire transmission and torque converter with a rebuilt unit to handle this power. So that's already in the Corvette. The transmission is brand new. It's got like 300 miles on it. The last video I made with this was with Sung Kang from the Fast and the Furious, and we surprised Marlin. We reunited him with his Ruby. He was the longtime previous owner who did a lot of the modifications, and he owned this car for about 20 years. So the C4 is all cleaned up. It runs really well. We did the 30 pound fuel injectors and the LT4 intake in the last video. And uh, really the only thing that's left on this car would be if you wanted to get it dyno tuned and really like dialed in. It doesn't make a ton of power. It's an LT1 with like five pounds of boost. It's quick and it runs good as is. I've had the wideband connected and it's all pretty much right there. So if you really wanted to squeeze the most out of it, you could have a dyno tune. That way you know it's running 100%. But other than that, I got a target top. Everybody would bug me. Your car doesn't have a target top. I'm like, yeah, I, I know that. <laughs> you should see the comments on the target top. It was insane, but it has a target top on it, ready to go. So, you know, again, at legitstreetcars at gmail.com if you want this. I think it's worth like, I don't know, like 15, 16 grand, something like that. Next is my wide body 1999 Porsche 911. It is LS swapped. It looks kind of crazy and it does have some issues. So we are going to try and resolve one of them and then head over to Fluid Motor Union to get OJ's opinion and check on the E55 wagon. I'm gonna keep this brief because we do have to get going, but the next video on the Porsche is supposed to be about the intake, getting our new hatch on and a tune. And right now, this does not close because it hits this intake. So I already have this loosened up and I just wanna try this air filter right here. So then we would switch over to speed density, which means we get rid of the mass airflow sensor. So if this fits and fixes all of our problems, we don't have to do any fabrication and running on speed density is fine with the LS. So anyway, uh, let's, let's see what happens. With this on, it still doesn't close. And that's because it's hitting the inside of the trunk lid right in this area here. And all of this has been cut up and messed with before. Well, let's just cut that out. There we go. All right, guys, let's see. Yeah, no, this is closed. This is closed. There's no latch in there right now, and the active arrow or whatever is up, but yeah, no, this is good. Okay, cool. You can kind of see the air filter right there as well. Someone used a self tapper to hold the spoiler in one position. All right, so I removed the self tappers and this should move now. Okay, yeah, this works manually. Our new hatch does have the actuators and the harness and the little fan that goes here. Everything is complete. So that could work if it clears, which so far it, it is. All right, we are back at Fluid Motor Union. Ah, oh, it's hard to turn this steering wheel. Got in here today. Lambo LS Swap 57 Chevy Ferrari. So many cool things. But the coolest thing at Fluid Motor Union, of course, is OJ Lopez. 
OJ, what's up, dude? Alex. You want to take a look at an intake? We've looked at it before. <laughs> I know you're kind of intaked out with that thing, which we're going to get to in a minute, but they uh, built we, an amazing custom intake for the E55 wagon. You could probably figure something out for this thing. So. Cool. All right. So I know you've seen this. This is how I bought it and a uh, little rigged up. It works. It's got a mass airflow sensor. The biggest issue here is that it doesn't close because it gets in the way. So we've talked about doing speed density and I brought you something to check out. Okay. Here it is. In all of my internet research, this is what I found. I, kind of smushed it in there a little bit because it's hitting the water pump pulley, but that is the smallest air filter that I can find that fits onto this throttle body. And it's still hitting. It's hitting, it's hitting the water pump. So what do you think about a smaller water pump? Vera, let's, let's put it on, I'll show you. All right, let me show you what's going on here. You wanna go ahead and put that on, smushed side down probably. Yeah, okay, so it fits there and it, and it whatever, it looks it okay. It's still hitting a little. I had to do a little trimming on the inside there. They had already trimmed a lot, but it is hitting a little bit inside. But I think part of the reason is it's hitting the water pump pulley right there. So if that water pump pulley was a smaller diameter, I believe this would go down a little bit. This is a six inch standard LS pulley. Have you seen smaller ones? Oh yeah. Okay. The difficulty is that a lot of these are the press fit ones. So I don't know, in order to do that, you'd have to necessarily swap out to another water pump. Like if that fixes my problem, I'm, I'm good. And then we'll spin the water pump a little bit faster, which, you know, I mean, technically would help cooling a little bit. It's not needed because the cooling system's working great, but it wouldn't hurt. To do all that work, have it be smaller and still be smashing the air filter every time you put the, the top down. Maybe just take the water pump pulley off first, see if it clears. Yeah. It, it, it's mostly just because I see it hitting here, but are we still going to be hitting on the actual deck light itself? Right. And if we are, should we be wasting that time trying to fit this or trying to cut this way? Yeah. All right, OJ and I are already looking for smaller pulleys for the water pump. But overall, I'm just looking for the simplest solution to this. And speed density is where you run with no mass airflow sensor. That's how I run my Turbo Trans Am and a bunch of LSs work that way. They have map sensors, so you can do that. There's really not any downside. I've been running speed density for like 15 years on the TA and it runs beautifully. So I'd rather do that because if we try to extend and build a custom intake, you know, somewhere over here, we have to worry about the cable driven throttle body. It's just going to be complicated. So path of least resistance here for this intake. And speaking of intakes, let me show you guys what OJ has done with the wagon. So if you guys remember the last time I had the E55 on the dyno here at Fluid, the intake was basically sucking shut. The air filters were very restrictive and it was way down on power. And when we ran open with no air filters, it gained a bunch of power. So OJ wanted to build something more permanent that still fits in the engine bay and looks good. So this isn't totally done yet, but the fabrication part is, this is all aluminum tubing and this is all custom, okay? So they custom hand built this here at Fluid. And this is what attaches to the throttle body. This is so much nicer than before because it's low profile before it was hitting the firewall basically. And it was just super restrictive. Now they have mapped this out with some much better flowing air filters. Uh, and I will get this powder coated the same satin black. And then we're hooking up a catch can. This is just temporary right now, but we're gonna have a catch can running through here as well and they are working on the final tune. We have to just dial in these gigantic 1050 cc fuel injectors with the E85. And then this thing will be back on the dyno screaming away. OJ is actually gonna be making a video on the E55, uh, I think next week or yeah, so, right? We're finishing up the uh, comparison of the Whipple and the VRP kit. So uh, getting your car in running order is pretty necessary to, <laughs> to be able to finish that. But we're seeing some good results so far and having the intake air temps not going where we wanted to um, with the pump. The intake was doing pretty well. So I think once we get that sorted, we're gonna be back at it, so. Cool. The coolant pump for the intercooler system went bad. So we got a new one on the way and then it'll hit the dyno. So if you guys wanna see a little sneak peek to what's going on with the E55, actually uh, there'll be a lot in that video. Check out Fluid Motor Union. They have an amazing YouTube channel. If you guys like real car content with very solid information, Fluid Motor Union, I'll link it down below. I believe I've covered every car that I currently own, but generally speaking, if you haven't seen the car on my channel in roughly about a year, it's most likely just sold and maybe you missed the last video. So check the playlists and the last video will explain where that car went or I make an announcement in an update video like this. A couple of cars just uh, that were around recently that are not would be that LS swapped Mercedes. That was a 1993 LS swapped uh, Mercedes 300D. Um, I did sell that, that is gone. And then the turbo 
Honda swapped Mercedes. You guys saw that I, that's, I traded it for that one. So that's gone as well. So both of those are totally gone. I don't have any more swapped Mercedes in the fleet. Uh, and then just sifting through my own videos, the CTS V wagon, uh, that was a daily driver for a bit. It was too nice for me to put through Chicago salty winters. I couldn't do it. There's 140 of them in that color. So I did sell the CTS V wagon. I miss it, but you know, I just, I'm running out of room as you can tell here. So I just can't keep everything. Well, let's see, we gave away a C63. We did a C63 giveaway that was given away. It's gone. Uh, what else? Uh, I gave away an ML500 last year, so that's gone. The blue WS6 Trans Am, that is also gone, sold that one. Oh, and my wife's twin Turbo Coyote Mustang, I sold that as well, that's gone. The blue Alpina, sold that, that's gone. Some people still ask about the Fox Body Mustang that I made a few videos on. Uh, that was never mine, that was owned by Eli. He's the one that I gave that white LT1 uh, Trans Am to. So that's his car, so my goal for that was always to get it to run and drive, clean it up a bit, but then kinda pass it along right back to him because he did wanna learn how to work on cars. So he's done lots of little things like add headers to it and fix you know, a broken distributor and he's been really wrenching on it and learning. The green E39 BMW, I did a ton of work. I got that one for, how much did I get this for? 900 bucks, it says right in my, right in my thumbnail. $900 beater to this was the last video. Uh, that was a great project fixed it up on a budget and then sold it. All right, I think that's all of the cars past and present, but if I've forgotten one, ask me about it in the comments and I will respond. So in the next video, I don't know, we're either gonna be on the CL or the Cobra, or maybe the Eclipse. Like I said, I'm halfway through with all of those videos. So whichever one has parts first, I guess. And right now I'm actually gonna be going on a much needed vacation and a lot of people always say this, like you just need to get out of town, like just in general to everybody, get out of town and forget about everything. I don't know about you guys, if you're working on car projects, it's very difficult to get out of town and forget about everything, especially when it's your business. Like I'm gonna be thinking a lot about what in the world is wrong with this McLaren? Do I need a $5,000 body control module? Is the Mustang harness, the new one that's flying in the mail, going to work? How long is it gonna take me to do that CL hose? So I, I'm gonna try my hardest. We're going to like a secluded area that's much warmer than Chicago. I'm gonna try my hardest to kind of escape for a little bit, but uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> I hope you guys really, really enjoyed this update video. If you did, give it a thumbs up, share the video with your friends, subscribe if you haven't already. And most importantly, have a fantastic day and I'll see all of you in the next video. The Cobra has even more electrical wiring gremlins. Gremlins? Nightmares. Oh no. Ugh. Ugh. That happened about 20 miles away from my house. I did make it home, but my driveway, uh, ah. Audio man, you ready? Video man? Or woman, are you ready? No, it's just me by myself, all right. That battery was pretty low, but it started. That probably wouldn't have gone in a, ah. All right, well I just charged up the battery and hopefully, so, ah. Well anyway, let me show you, uh, we're gonna try, we're gonna try and fix the, we're gonna try and fix the McLaren. The Holden community of the, the Holden community. I got to meet most, look, I even have, I even have an extra, I even went and bought a. I don't have an ETA on when I'm starting on the engine though, because I have so many other projects. I'm like, right, done. Uh, maybe we can blend some audio and I'll say something in here. I don't know what, I might sing. Song, Taylor Swift song, or something. Love story, maybe. Hey, Max, can you turn the heat off right now? I, just, I can't move. Right yeah, I'm recording. I can't move. This guy. I'm frozen in time this while guy. the heater turns off and blows air into my mic. So, you have a really good editor. Thank you. I'm just kidding. Cut this scene out. You should fire him. <laughs>